Welcome back for the afternoon session. We are going to sprint, not walk to the finish line here with some very interesting topics this afternoon. But before we get started with the session on GU malignancies, we have an oral presentation from Dr. Vivek Mehta about an interesting case that he has prepared in abstract form. Don't forget now to uh, fill out your evaluation forms, which, we will, which we, you can turn in on the way out uh, uh, to pick up your CME certificates. And speakers, please, once again, don't forget to uh, complete those attestation forms for us. So without any further ado, Dr. Mehta, welcome. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I would also like to thank Binitara Foundation and all the members of the committee for giving me this opportunity. My name is Vivek Mehta. I'm a third year internal medicine resident at a residency program in Derby, Mercy Catholic Medical Center. My colleagues are Nicholas Pozasri, Usma Khan, Apana Basu, Bulani Gavaramasi, has helped me preparing this, and my preceptor is Dr. Michael Rastut, who is a practicing oncologist in Philadelphia. I do not have any disclosures. So first I'll be talking about the case um, that I'm presenting, and then I'll talk further about the granule cell um, tumors, uh, specifically of the trochea bronchial tree. So the case I'm presenting is of a 56-year-old African-American female who presented to our emergency department for the chief complaint of shortage of breath, cough, and chest pain. She had been to the emergency department within the past 30 days with the similar complaints. She was given oral medication, Zithromax, and uh, sent home. She had a medical history of COPD, schizophrenia, CVA, hypertension. Um, she was a heavy smoker, um, used to drink every day, and lived in a group home. So with this presentation, um, we got a chest x-ray. We showed this. Um, so like you can see, uh, we are concerned about this possible consolidation on left side. So following this, we obtained a CT scan of the chest. And like you can see, there was this mass here, and which can be better seen in this view as well. So following these images, we also got uh, pulmonology, pulmonology evaluation. And we discussed with radiology as well. And they said that these findings could be actually just mucus plugging uh, with her mucus production. And one approach would be we can give her insensitive spirometry and follow up in four weeks to make sure that it went away. Now, she did not follow up uh, within four weeks, but she did come back to emergency department um, after five weeks uh, with similar complaints of shortness of breath, cough, wheezing. Um, she was admitted, again, for COPD exacerbation, possible tracheobronchitis. Again, in this chest x-ray, a similar finding was seen. So this time, decision was made that we should proceed with bronchoscopy. And when we did the bronchoscopy, we showed, it, it showed a polypoid mass in left mainstream bronchus. So the mass was biopsied and sent to the pathology department. This is the picture of uh, the biopsy. So this is the bronchial tissue, and this is the uh, mass. This is the tumor. This is a high field view, and it shows that the cells have eosinophilic cytoplasm. And these eosinophilic granules are very, very specific for the granular cell tumor. And more specific is this S100 protein stain, um, which shows that it's granular cell tumor. So now coming to our main topic, granular cell tumor of tracheobronchial tree. So granular cell tumors, per se, were first described by um, Dr. Abrik Kosov in 1926. They are seen in tongue, skin, subcutaneous tissue, breast, but it's very uncommon for them to present in lung. Initially, it was termed granular cell myoblastoma by Dr. Abrikosov because he thought it was myogenic in origin. Um, but this theory, as, we, as electron microscopy became available and immunohistochemical stains became available, was challenged. And around 1960s, um, they agreed that it, was a, that it was actually neural in origin. And it was, most basically, it was, thought, it was thought to be related to squamous cells. Um, Dr. Odenos, in his a uh, review article in 1999 goes in more details talking about how all these changes happened throughout the year. And he says that maybe these, are, uh, these tumors were actually described in uh, 18th century as well. It's just that Dr. Abrikosov uh, explained them in further detail. Um, 
so talking about granular cell tumors, they are seen in patients ranging from 10 years to 50 years, more commonly seen in um, third to fourth decade, um, more common in women than men, pulmonary granular cell tumors. They comprise of about 6 to 10 percent of all granular cell, granular cell tumors. It was first reported by Dr. Kramer in 1938. So far, there have been around 100 cases of the same. There have been cases of uh, pulmonary granular cell tumors associated with uh, various organs, tongue, kidney, esophagus, and it can happen metachronously in the single lung as well. Now, most of these tumors are benign, and there has been only one case report of malignant pulmonary uh, granular cell tumor, um, which was described in year 2003. Uh, that case report was by Dr. Jiang. Um, even that case report, it, wasn't, it, it hadn't metastasized, and it was resected. And uh, for the follow-up, described by the Dr. Jiang, the uh, patient was fine. So these are the diagnostic criteria for malignant um, granular cell tumor, described by Dr. Fanberg and Smith. Uh, so there are six criteria related to necrosis, pendling, vesicular nuclei with large nucleoli, increased metriotic activity, high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, and pleomorphism. Uh, so you have to meet um, at three or more criteria out of the six for it to be called a metastatic thesis. And the one case report that we have of pulmonary metastatic uh, granular cell tumor um, met uh, five criteria out of six. Uh, talking specifically about uh, pulmonary granular cell tumors, there are no commonly agreed risk factors, mainly because it's so uncommon, and there haven't been any, biggest, any big studies regarding that. Um, there was one Dutch, uh, one Dutch study which came out in 2000 where they looked at patients from 1990 to, to, uh, to 1999, and 65% of those patients were, um, were smokers, um, but it wasn't reproduced in other studies. So now clinical, coming to clinical representation. So like our patient, most of the pa in approximately half of the patient uh, is an incidental finding. When you are, mainly when you are imagining patients for something else or when you're doing bronchoscopy for some other reason, is found. Um, two of the biggest, bigger studies, one was by Dr. Wender Matten. That's the study that I just talked about. Um, he looked at the uh, patients be between 1990 and 2000 uh, from a Dutch registry, and he found 30 patients, um, and total of 31 tumors, uh, which had granular, granular cell tumors. And another one done before that in 1995 was by Dr. Devers, and uh, he found 20 patients of the same. Now, when they do produce symptoms, uh, they are mainly because of the location, and the respiratory symptoms that's, that are commonly seen are cough, dyspnea, hemoptysis, and wheezing. Sometimes, um, because of the obstruction, you see post-obstruction atelectasis, which was seen in our patient as well, and post-obstructive pneumonia as well. When you biopsy them, uh, microscopically, these tumors are polygonal to ovoid, with abundant eosinophilic and granular cytoplasm. The nuclei are usually small, hyperchromatic, sometimes accidentally located as well. The cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic granules characteristic of uh, granular cell tumors are periodic acid sky positive, and S100 protein is invariably expressed. These are just the images that I showed you earlier of our patient. Now, one interesting aspect of this is that uh, nearly one third of these cases um, may have concurrent pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, uh, which may show squamous cell proliferation. So when you biopsy them, you might confuse them uh, to be a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, but if you, if you look at the tissue, um, mo most of the times, you'll be able to distinguish both of, between both of them. Coming to the management. Um, so the problem is that there haven't been any bigger studies because it's so rare. And the main, uh, the main study in 1980, there was a review article by Dr. Daniel. Um, at that time, he looked at, he looked at around uh, 45 cases and uh, showed uh, and reviewed what treatment they had got. He found 13 cases which were removed bronchoscopically and 32 cases which were resected. Uh, reviewing the literature, he, he, he thought that when tumor was 8 mm or less in size, it was less likely to have infiltrated the tissue. And so it was okay to uh, remove it with bronchoscopy. 
But larger than that, you should always consider surgical, uh, surgical remover because there are high chances of recurrence because it's very unlikely that you'll be able to remove whole, all the tissue. Um, about the same thing. Uh, so adequate treatment strategies for this disease remains controversial. Bronchoscopic resection in asymptomatic patients with a tumor having a diameter of less than 8 mm has been suggested as preferred treatment. Now, like I said, 10 to 20 percent patient um, might have multicentric lesion, and in, that, in those patients, if lesions are less than one centimeter, they, may, they can be removed bronchoscopically, and larger than one centimeter, uh, they should be resected. Uh, this number, 54 percent. So even when you remove them, granule cell tumor, per se, are known to have recurrence. Um, most of the times it's local. And the problem is that if you remove it bronchoscopically, there are 54% chances that it might come back. Uh, this, number com this number comes back from, comes from the study by Dr. Daniels. Uh, so if tumor is large, surgical approach is preferred. And based on size, location, and number of masses, a surgical option, um, including either segmentectomy, lobectomy, with or without sleeve resection, or lightly pneumatectomy can be chosen with a lower incidence of recurrence and long disease-free survival. Um, again, for coming to the follow-up, Dr. Wender Matten said that uh, you can follow these patients yearly for about five years to make sure that there is no recurrence. Uh, but then there have been studies where recurrence has been seen after seven years because of how slow-growing this tumor is. Uh, so it still remains controversial how long you need to follow them. Um, but it's very unlikely that you need to follow them more frequently just because of, because of how slow it grows. Thank you. Any how questions? How did you manage this patient? Uh, so this patient, uh, it was, uh, the tumor was removed bronchoscopically, uh, but it was not, this facility was not available at our institute, so she was transferred at a, another center. Um, so, that's a good question. The patient actually, interestingly, just presented to our institute again last month, and on imaging, we did find that she has something there. The problem is that, like we said, she lives in a group home. Her schizophrenia is a limiting factor for follow-up, so we are trying to arrange her to get a bronchoscopy, and we'll have a better picture regarding uh, what she has now and what should be done. Is there any role for chemotherapy in these patients? Um, there, there hasn't been any role shown, mainly for metastatic cancers. There, there has only been one, one report of metastatic lung tumor, uh, but for the skin tumors, there, have been, there has been no, no role shown for chemo. But I was reading one article, and they said that they recently used pezopenib um, to treat one of the, one of the tumor. Uh, the patient was, went to Cuba, and he had recurrence. It, was, it grew everywhere. And they, they were trying pezopenib, but I couldn't find regarding what happened to that. So I'm not sure how effective it is. Did you suggest what the cell of origin is for these tumors? Um, so now they pretty much agree that it's uh, squan cells that this uh, tumor come from uh, because, of, um, because of S100. Yeah. Neural death. yeah. Um, so when they biopsy, they usually um, take they, they, the the six criteria that I told you about. Uh, they look at those criteria, and if it misses more than three of them, they call it uh, malignant. Uh, but per se, transformation from benign to malignant, uh, I'm not sure if that has been uh, reported. Thank you very much.